Hey there, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. Um, I'm really looking forward to having Eric Kaysen back on my show after a while. Uh, we haven't talked uh, in a while and uh, he's the author and um, creator of the, the platform um, and blog platform CryptoSovereignty.org. Check out his website and you can also find him on Twitter. Uh, Twitter handle is Eric Kaysen. So let me know if you have any questions afterwards. Uh, the reason I want to have uh, this talk with him is um, because he has a really profound knowledge, uh, not only philosophical, but really a deeper understanding of the rabbit hole Bitcoin when it comes to Bitcoin sovereignty, I would call it. You know, And um, because the question I'm always asking myself is when when the lawmaker, the government, the nation state in collusion with the central banks or vice versa, and all the, you know, the structures are surrounded for the execution of its, of its, you know, uh, um, unethical, you know, unconstitutional and, and literally criminal, um, uh, tax, you know, laws, um, and with all its criminal immu immunity and, and political untouchability and, uh, you know, non-accountability. Um, what else? What What other choice do we have than Bitcoin? Creating, you know, the structures, the architectural foundation uh, to free ourselves exactly from all these centralized, um, you know, entities and structures uh, to be literally free again. And that's what we are, you know, aspiring for and desiring, right? So yeah, that's what Bitcoin is all about. It's about freedom, and uh, that's the reason I want to talk with uh, Eric Kaysen. So. Without further ado, this is my talk with Eric Kaysen. Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show with Eric Kaysen. Eric, I've had you, I haven't had you on my show for a long time now. Uh, how are you? How are you doing? Thanks so much for your time. Uh, pretty, pretty good. You know, it's uh, it's a beautiful winter here in California, and I've just been having time to to go kind of deeper into my own philosophy, and I'm looking forward to sharing more with that, with you today. Beautiful. Uh, listen, I want to, you know, uh, since, um, um, uh, uh, what's his name? I'm sorry. Um, I feel, uh, uh, Parker Lewis already, uh, mm. came up with this article and, um, and it made sort of, sort of, uh, I made sort of that connection with your, uh, with what you published your works. And, uh, I've read s some of your articles today, um, on cryptosovereignty.org. And I want to start off with um, with uh, one of the last paragraphs of your article. It's called uh, "Crypto Sovereignty," and let me just, if I may, just read it for my listeners. Uh, crypto sovereignty is the newfound ability for any single human to choose to put their economic, social, and political power into a new crypto commonwealth where the rules of the system can never be broken or violated. Unlike all forms of contemporary sovereign law, crypto sovereignty is the newly formed political power that each and every human has to refuse to the transgressions and violations of state powers and to choose to abandon these antiquated systems to create something better together with using crypto or in this case, uh, what I want to talk about, uh, about uh, Bitcoin. So Eric, um, can you like um, give a like a distillate, like a summary of this article and the other one, maybe in connection with the other uh, article you wrote, the encrypted meaning of, of crypto? You published that uh, on September, um, uh, September 2019 uh, uh, on your website, cryptosovereignty.org. Um, and before you start off, you know, I was oh, constantly thinking about, about why, why are we doing this? You know, what is the root cause? What is the root problem? And I always have to think, you know, about this, um, short interview or quote from Hayek, where he says, um, I don't believe the Austrian economist Hayek for, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I don't believe we shall ever have a good money again before we take the thing, meaning the issuance and power of the, over the money out of the hands of government. That is, we cannot take it violently out of the hands of government 
all we can do is by some sly roundabout way introduce something that they cannot stop. So go ahead, Eric. What is sure, yeah? F funny enough, uh, reading Hayek and his denationalization of currency in 2012 was a large part of setting me on the path of <clears throat> uh, really understanding why Bitcoin was so powerful. And so this first uh, article that you discuss, discuss called Crypto Sovereignty, it's kind of the large overview of a lot of my own philosophical ideas about what uh, cryptography enables. And, and essentially, like my what, what I see is that with the internet and the ability for any individual to use cryptography and to actually fundamentally understand how cryptography is able to encrypt information in such a way that any form of power cannot break it. Uh, that's a very real individual tool that people can use. Uh, and Bitcoin within this, uh, explicitly because of the way that Satoshi made it, the way that he refused to be identified, and the way that he removed himself with the project, uh, I think all of these things combined it in such a way that he made a system that's inviolable. There's no fundamental way for it to be broken outside of the parameters of a 51% attack or something else. Uh, in conjunction with the way that it's actually using the commoditization of electrical energy itself, all these things together kind of create this perfect puzzle in order to be able to make what I call crypto sovereignty. This ability to be able to utilize cryptography to protect your data. And now with Bitcoin, we, the data that we're protecting is actually our wealth itself. And because we're protecting wealth now, we've actually, as I kind of indicated in that article, I believe that we've actually created a new kind of commonwealth. And when I use this word commonwealth, I, I use it in the philosophical tense of how Hobbes once used it. Because actually, like most of my philosophy is derived uh, directly from Hobbes and specifically from his books, Leviathan, and his, his follow-up book, Behemoth, both of which kind of dealt with the eschatological consequences of what it meant to have a kingdom of heaven. And so ultimately, essentially, I see the way that cryptography does it, it inverts the sovereign formula of uh, instead of authority, not truth creates legitimacy, we've inverted the formula in totality. So that truth, not, not authority, creates legitimacy. And, and funny enough, in a world today where essentially nation states have deemed themselves as omnipotent sovereigns for whatever reason they see fit, this actually becomes kind of the ultimate weapon because of the ability for people to be able to refuse giving it up. So... Right. So, um, you know, we have to remind ourselves, um, Eric, that um, we're talking about the nation state, the governments and the central banks and, you know, the whole uh, surrounding structures that support it, execute it, implement it, even including the executive, legislative and judicial system. So I just want to make, you know, I, ha I want to remind myself and all uh, you know, all our listeners and uh, you again is that we talk about like um, not only unethical and uh, immoral acts um, or system structures, we talk about criminality. So I sometimes I'm asking myself what needs to happen. You know, people, uh, you know, they type, they love to do, you know, like analogies, like historic analogies, you know, oh my God, horrendous times and yeah, it's uh, maybe we don't have those times yet, uh, um, anymore, but it's more subtle, maybe. You know, we experience uh, yeah, those I, things more subtle, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think um, something that, that's horribly underestimated is, uh, like, we live in a panopticon today. Like, it's very obvious that uh, large corporations such as Amazon and others are working with the nation and state providing their information. And the danger is, is that like we're creating this gigantic open air prison of the entire globe that's latticed with these security apparatuses. And the very real danger is, is that like by being watched itself, there's this real danger that behaviors start to modify and that people can't actually speak truth to power in the way that they once could. Another one that I actually think is interesting is uh, like more and more I'm getting into the theological dialogue of this stuff and I never intended to. It's the fact that at the very bottom, the philosophy and the theology meet up and fuse. Um, and we have all of this dialogue in crypto about the idea of code is law or law is code. 
And nobody's really tried to dig deeply into to what does this mean? And so a large part of my own philosophy is, is dealing with a man named Giorgio Ambigen. And specifically, I started with this book called The Sacrament of Language. It's mm -hmm. called, an, and the second title is An Archaeology of the Oath. Because when I first discovered Bitcoin, I was so fascinated. I was like, how, how can cryptography create this obligation to itself, which is completely impossible to violate in any way, shape, or form? And essentially at the bottom of it, uh, like I actually believe what Bitcoin and the blockchain is, is a kind of semantic form that forces itself into a binary of truth or false. And because of that binary it's forced into, it literally has no capacity to be able to lie. And so like we kind of glitched out the actual function that law has vis-a-vis -vis man and the oath. Because the original idea is I take an oath to the law, I violate it, you fucking kill me. But we live in the world of fork tongued men and cowards where anybody can stand up and say whatever lie that they want to and call it truth. Uh, and this allows for us to essentially glitch out that final function of man living in a world full of liars and being able to renew the power of truth. And the funniest thing about all of this is, is that Satoshi Nakamoto and what he created, by the simple virtue of that he created a system that's obligated towards truth, he created the most powerful object in the world. And, and not because of, of what it is, but because of what man is in the way that we've just become forked tongue liars. Right, and the principle of violence and aggression is the foundational principle of nation states enforcement, whatever, even taxes, you know, paying taxes or, uh, Absolutely. uh ex you know, um, execution of laws. Um, it's, uh, I think w the problem is we don't know any other way mm -hmm. of, um, of interaction of, 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 of structures. So people are so conditioned and indoctrinated. They, you know, we don't even know what it would be like. This is why, you know, I think most people have even a problem not only understanding, but imagining what life and societal structures could be like on a monitor root laying of Bitcoin. Absolutely. And I mean, you know? I think uh, terror is a huge part of it. You know, like the, the very real truth is, is that uh, like through my Bitcoin sovereignty, like I'm much freer than, you know, people have, have way more wealth than me because the truth is, is that at any point in time, somebody can be like, oh, this guy committed some crime. The government can show up and shut down their accounts. And one of the other reasons I got involved in Bitcoin early on was before Bitcoin, I was in banking. And part of my job in banking was I shut down people's bank accounts. You know, and it, it was wrong, but literally I would get a call from the sheriff and they'd say, hey, shut it down. And I remember I talked to my boss about it and I was like, don't we need a warrant or something like this? And they're like, no, no, we're a private company. We don't have to do business with anybody oh we don't have to do. And we're, you know, the police officers are so kind as to let us know the criminals are trying to use our bank so we can shut it down. Uh, and I guess in some ways, like this is a good connection to my most recent and very large article called Theory of the Crypto Partisan, which is kind of part of this idea of that uh, in the world we exist today, this term criminal, it's been so deeply infusiated with, uh, you know, individuals that are, are making sort of uh, ethical violations and, you know, we'll throw all the small time criminals in jail. But the truth is, is stuff like, you know, uh, historically going back to the Holocaust, like that was a legal action. And it was a legal action where the German legal system was able to strip Jews of their actual citizens right. so that non-people were all killed. And like they were killed inside of the purview of the law. Right. Uh, and it's really, really scary because the law always has that capacity to be able to strip people of their identity and say, this person is an enemy. And they're not actually even afforded rights at this point in time. And to me, that's the most terrifying thing. And also the ultimate irony of me being like an anarchist is that like, I'm here like defending the law more than others because I'm like, no, there needs to be like a unitary idea. Like if I'm a criminal for stealing, so should the bank should be criminal for stealing as well. And so essentially, like, I think we're at a place that, that things are so radically out of control that the economic answer is the only answer at this point in time. Like I, I, I hate that the American elections are coming up right now because everybody gets this deep messianism about this idea of like, oh, Bernie will save us or Trump. Yeah. Or, 
and the truth is, is it's all, it's all an insane distraction. You know, like none of these people can do anything to change. None of them. The, it's know. political and we got to go away from, got to, you know, distance. We got to really say goodbye to politics. It's all politics. And with Bitcoin, you know, I, th I think for me, Bitcoin is really a non-political and, and, you know, a non-political instrument of, you know, a, a structure, a foundation and architecture, you know, as, as also, you know, it's like um, uh, Andreas Antonopoulos also preaches about. But the thing is, I was thinking of Buckminster Fuller, who said, I'm um, paraphrasing him, you know, because now it's too late, you know, now it's too late to fight against the system. It, we should have done that a, a long time ago, you know, talk about, you know, revolutions here, that, you know, occupy this, occupy that, going on the street. So it's, it's too late for this bullshit. So uh, what we need well, to do is occupy is how I... Yeah, I found ahead. the movement, you know, like, uh, like I was a leftist and, and I believe deeply in socialist principles mm -hmm. and I went out and I marched with these people and I quickly realized like they, they were desperate, like that's why they were on the street. And furthermore, because of their desperation, like they couldn't, they couldn't look at the situation and see that it wasn't because of the magnanimity of governments not protecting them that they're in trouble. It was because the government was sending people to hurt us because they didn't like the fact that we're trying to have these conversations. Right. And when I came away from all of this, I became deeply affected in that like, it's clear to me that this problem is entirely economic and that we're not looking at it in a thoughtful way, you know? And, and I think one of the other ones that's more important is, you know, so it was back in 2012 that like I fully bit into the Apple. Like I put all my wealth into Bitcoin and like that was it. And that's what I chose to do moving forward. Mm -hmm. And most people think it's insane and it's risky and it's volatile and it is all of those things. But what I also learned through that was the courage and the fortitude to say, you know what, I would rather fucking lose everything on the risk of this new kind of money that could actually change the world rather than crippling in defeat and saying, you know what, we can't do something this big. And the truth is, is through that action, I now have a type of freedom and capacity to go out in the world and do what I want. And one of the things that I think is the most important about the conversion over to this new monetary system that hopefully will remain outside of the purview of the nation state is people don't realize how much of the global economy is just straight up gobbled up by inflation and by all of the general mechanics of monetary manipulation. And so I sincerely believe if we just like lop that chunk out, the, the way that a deflationary money like Bitcoin would operate and create a much larger component of wealth for people is so much more than, than we ever thought. Like I, I think most of the social problems, uh, if we actually had like, a, if bit if the nation state was able to back off and say, you know what, we can't control the entire monetary system, we'll do a small taxation at the point of sale using these things. I actually think pretty much most social things could be paid for with the additional overlay of people could have some say in how the money's actually spent. I don't know how any of these things happen, but I do know that through Bitcoin and its sovereignty of not being able to be directly extrapolated from people, that that creates a new mechanism for individuals to actually display their real democratic power, uh, as opposed to this bullshit of voting and believing that that does something. Right. And that needs, uh, again, you know, a critical adoption rate with, uh, with all the practic with all the practical necessities that, uh, is really urgently needed now. Um, cause you know, we, we, uh, uh, I also don't, don't use the word mass adoption anymore. I think, if a certain percentage, you know, of society wakes up and starts at least just saving some Satoshi, some Bitcoin, and then eventually as the technology develops, you know, privacy, coin mixing, you know, all these instruments that are f running a full node, it's really, uh, it's, it's, uh, I think we have to lower the, the, the bar or what do you call it? The measuring stick for, you know, according to the average user out there, the average Bitcoin beginner out there. And it's, it's, it's overwhelming. The technology is really overwhelming for most people. So I think if, if the technology was there, if it was created right now as an all in one kit, people would use it. You just create well, a demand. I think it, that there, there's a, a, a dual problem. And one is that I think you're absolutely right with kind of the, the technical difficulties, uh, that, that people have. A great example is I, I have a lot of people that are boomers that come to me and try to ask me about Bitcoin. And it's been really difficult because uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but like uh, I was actually 
part of Coinbase. I was there from, from 2013 to 2017. Mm -hmm. I helped build out the support organization as the support manager. I'm very sorry if you ever had a ticket come through and it wasn't answered. <laughs> um, but the long I story short is, is uh, on the back end, things were very complicated in conjunction with uh, the place that I felt very upset is when Coinbase went from being a Bitcoin brokerage service to being a shitcoin casino. Yeah. And that's also when I left the company because of my disagreements with it. Um, but now there's new services. Like, I'm not sure if you've heard of river.com. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like they're, they're a Bitcoin only service and it's been great because I've been yeah. able to send some of my older friends there because, because that commitment that they've made, it's very easy for people that don't have the technical chops to now be able to use a service like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's one component. And then I think also as the privacy things get integrated, as we get Schnorr signatures and these other things, that's going to be a next huge component. And then I honestly think the final one is, is that uh, I think outside of technological nerds who think this stuff is cool because they get it immediately, uh, we're not actually going to get kind of, I don't, the, not the mass adoption, but I think more of a, an intolerant minority that's militant. Yeah, exactly. Bitcoin. Would it be three, four or 5%, you know what I'm saying? Like this and could I think be done that easily, that, you know, this could yeah, be done easily. It, and I honestly think the way it has to be done is politically. Like, I actually think you need to get people. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I say political, I don't mean like a political party, but I actually mean something much more like an anarchist syndicate of being mm -hmm. like, look, this is our revolutionary tool to change the world. If you have this Bitcoin, people can't just beat the crap out of you and take it from you. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and it's really funny because I thought that was going to develop sometime last decade, but it didn't. Uh, and more and more, I'm afraid it won't develop, and I'm not sure how harmful that is. Uh, but I definitely think like an actual political syndicate, if you will, that was committed towards getting Bitcoin in the hands of people for economic empowerment. I do think that would actually move the needle in a pretty important direction because I feel pretty strongly that most people don't really understand the the reason that Bitcoin is so valuable. They they seem to understand that it's independent in some way, or maybe like a gold. But it's really the cryptography at the bottom of it, you know, this tool of war that has now been expropriated by people. Uh, like that, that's the real gold, if you will, is the fact that like I can encrypt any data set I want and no government can get at it. So, you know, and, and, and frankly, the other one is, is with the rampant privacy violations, like this mm -hmm. is something that we need. And uh, as I said earlier, you know, like I came at this from a philosophical angle, but more and more theological stuff started getting presented. And one thing that uh, this philosopher, Walter Benjamin, who I consider kind of like my lead individual for like my perspective on philosophy, he says something in uh, called his theses on history, where at the end he says, look, the Messiah doesn't arrive as the redeemer. He, he arrives as the vanquisher of the Antichrist. And I actually believe like what's happening with privacy violation, like it is fundamentally the antichrist you know whether you're christian or not you can look at it and be like yeah the violation of privacy is fundamentally fucking evil and it seems to be rampant and everywhere and it wants to suck up all information and it seems like the only response mm -hmm. fucking encrypt everything you know what if you guys want to spy on everything we won't let you see anything and i know that the fbi and other three-letter agencies in the united states have been really worried about the internet going dark and the real hope that I have is that there's going to be a turn where they go, you know what, there's no way to prevent this. And the, the truth is, is that privacy uh, really is one of the bedrocks of liberty. And we just need to move forward from a Western standpoint of that people are going to have privacy now. And there's just nothing we can do about it other than utilizing right. our actual constitutional rights in order to move through legally. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if the government shows up with a warrant and says, hey, you need to decrypt stuff. Uh, if people have the ability to resist, that's their own. But if they can't, it's decrypted. Like it went through a legal pathway and I'm not as deeply alarmed as that as them capturing somebody and saying, Hey, this is a state secret. We can't even put this person on trial because they're so dangerous. Um, right. Um, uh, no, excellent. Um, and Eric, so what, uh, so to come back to Buckminster Fuller, uh, Fuller, uh, Fuller, is that his name? Yeah. So he said, uh, sort of that, uh, this is, I think, you know, the, 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 the best, ex I mean, the best p case of, of, of illustrating how, how it works when you don't have to fight the conventional or the established system, you, you create a new structure. This is sort of, I'm paraphrasing him sort of, you, you, you don't fight the old system. It's just sort of a waste of energy. You, you build new structures 
and by building new structures, new architectures, right, new foundations, mm -hmm. you make the old ones just become obsolete, sort of. Yes, I think I'm paraphrasing, hopefully correctly. So, um, so this is what Bitcoin is about, right? So the more pressure it be, it it sort of uh, it encounters, the more pressure or resistance or uh, coercion, violence, um, the stronger it becomes. Could you uh, absolutely? Um, I I wrote an article that I didn't publish long ago called uh, Anti-Fragile Bitcoin, where I took the Nassim to lead a concept of this. And mm -hmm. uh, in international relations, there's something called brinkmanship. And it's this idea of escalating dangerous scenarios in a way in order to benefit yourself. And so I actually think uh, cryptography and the state have this generalized brinkmanship against each other uh, that's constantly escalating. And the production of new cryptography like ZK Snarks and Starks and all this stuff that was explicitly developed from this escalation with the state over the last decade on crypto. Mm -hmm. And I think like this is sort of the dynamic process. And eventually like it escalates fully to the place where like a state says this thing's illegal, we attack it. And then people are like, yeah, great fucking luck. Here's all of the different deployed decentralized methods that we have for you to buy and use this. Good luck. Um, you know, and one of the other things that's not talked about much either is like, I actually think one of the most important developments in the display of how powerful Bitcoin is to be able to create markets are these online drug markets that we've seen. Mm -hmm. You know, wh whether they're ethical or not, I don't care. The point is, is that there's an ability for large decentralized online markets to establish themselves that governments can't control. You know, and with what we were talking about earlier with the coronavirus, like who knows, like maybe they come to deploy different medicines in these crazy scenarios or whatever. But the biggest thing is, is that these economies can actually be established. And at this point, people have only used them for these more kind of, uh, nascent and uh, nefarious deeds, if you will, not that I care about people doing that to their bodies. Um, but I think ultimately, like we're actually gonna see markets establish themselves where we go, look, the, like here in, here in California, uh, I used to be a cannabis grower a couple of years ago. I can't mm -hmm. do it anymore because we've all gotten pushed out. And one of the big reasons is, is because the amount of federal regulations and bureau, or not federal, but state regulations in conjunction with our state sales tax now is 30%. Well, wow. you know, like that, that's just too much money, you know, and like right. it, it really scares me because like, of course, a big corporation can pay that, but little guys can't. And I grew up here in California and for a very long time, like we had, we had local black market economies for cannabis that were great because like it was just, it was small time things. Everybody would make a couple thousand dollars throughout the season. We'd all exchange with each other and that's all been crushed out now. There's right. only huge growers and uh, it would be really great to see people really making a strong choice to say, hey, we can use Bitcoin to resist taxes. We can use Bitcoin to create markets. We can use Bitcoin to, you know, I'd love to see like a national syndicate in the United States for cannabis growers. Because the truth is, is totally legal for me to do it here in California. I go over three states. I go to prison for 10 years. It's right. ridiculous. Right. You know, um, I, I, I had a recent interview with, um, recently I had an interview with Michael Krieger. Do you know him? Uh, he writes mm -hmm. also some good articles. Anyway, so um, he, he wrote a bunch of really good articles about localism and then we talk about secession. You know, I, I, I even half jokingly said, you know, why wouldn't, for example, you know, the state of Wyoming, you know, who are so innovative and progressive, why don't they just, you know, secede from the United States, you know? And he said, you know, localism and secession, like seceding from, uh, you know, a, a nation state, doesn't matter where, should be actually part of a normal human experience. You know, it shouldn't be something like not imaginative or something. So do you think Bitcoin is, is that key to like freeing yourself from all this centralization, whether it be nation states, a government, uh, you know, a supranational entity? It's like, you know, fuck you all. You know, we'll, you know, we'll do our own thing. We have our, we have our own, you know, the best money ever created in human history. And that is Bitcoin. We have our circle economies. Um, I, I think it's a really key component, but I think uh, the, there's going to be something really different about it that we don't really recognize as much. And the best that I can kind of see is, is it's almost similar to the way um, essentially like in, 
in the 11th and 12th century as a reactionaryism against the corruption of feudalism in the way that essentially like robber barons could just do whatever the hell they wanted throughout the countryside, uh, both communes and congiatos were created, which were essentially agreements among people where they said, look, I pledge loyalty to you, you pledge loyalty to me. When this prince asshole shows up, let's kill him. And that's our commitment to each other is essentially that's the number one commitment. And so I essentially think Bitcoin is going to be something similar because with the Holy Roman Empire, you know, there was like these 450 different states that were all kind of loosely confederated. But the important thing was, was because of the confederation, the prince was limited in certain ways. He couldn't just go beat the crap out of you and steal all your money or else you'd have the Holy Roman Empire show up with his army and be like, yo, you kind of beat up on my bro here. Uh, and so I think we're going to get something pretty similar, but it's going to essentially be like the internet's almost this overlay for a secondary network of rights. Um, and I actually think the coolest thing is, is like when we're going to start getting these sort of dead man key protocols and, um, I remember once at Coinbase, I was sharing with some of my friends, uh, there's this great movie in the, United, uh, it's an American movie called Ransom from the 1990s where Mel Gibson's kid is abducted. Mm. Uh, but there's, there's this really great scene where like, uh, uh, he has like, I think $2 million like in cash spread out on this table in front of him. And he's like, hey, he's like, terrorist guy who took my kid. Like, here's the $2 million that you asked as the ransom. And he's like, this is the closest you'll ever get to it because I'm using this money to put a bounty on your head. So do whatever you want, but you're probably going to die and never see this money, or you can walk away. And I actually think we're going to get something pretty similar with Dead Man's Keys because, uh, you know, I think the government's going to show up to intimidate people and to try to take their Bitcoin and we'll get a executive order very similar to the 6102 that happened in the United States that took gold from people. Uh, and... You know, like, I think a lot of people will probably lose their Bitcoin on custodial exchanges, but I think there will be enough people that haven't used it that uh, it's going to become kind of this gigantic game that can never be stopped. Mm -hmm. And through that gigantic game, like, we'll see huge inflation and the whole thing's going to kind of play out in this pretty epic way that, you know, everybody seems to be suspicious of, but it just seems so radically huge that we... We can't really wrap our minds around it, you know? Right. Well, uh, Eric, so let me, uh, let's wrap this up a little bit early, but I want to ask you finally, Eric, um, what do you think is required? What is really necessary to make this process more effective, a little bit more effective, a little bit more, not speedier, but you know, a little bit more, how, how can we onboard more users? How can we help them, support them, educate them more? How can we sensitize them or, uh, you know, make them like, you know, raise that wake up call. How, how do we do that in your opinion? Uh, I think it's really focusing on the philosophical aspects of this because like the money part's great and everybody's pretty distracted by it, but it's really going past the say, look, like what, what is the money? Like, isn't our money supposed to be a societal protocol for wealth? And what does it mean that when that societal protocol, you know, you and I have to go work for it or invest for it, but there's literally a class of people that that money's just given to them, mm -hmm. you know? And to me, it seems that the entire economic system has broken down in a way that it's not just about the rich against the poor. It's about the powerful versus the disempowered and the way that they can utilize that power to create benefits for themselves. I very sincerely believe that, that Bitcoin is the fairest economic system in existence right. because of the very way that, you know, we, you can only produce coins through proof of work or exchange. You know, every single other coin, whether it's proof of stake or a lot of the different POW coins, pretty much every single one of them has had some sort of unfair distribution. And the biggest thing I can point to is, look, Satoshi was magnanimous enough to just walk away from the situation. Right. He could be the richest man alive today, and he chose not to. And that mm -hmm. was a gift that he chose to give to us. And I think we really need to look at that and understand that this is our best shot to be able to fight back against both right. the digital panopticon and the economic imperialism that, you know, as an American, it, it's... Uh, more difficult for us to see it but you go somewhere in the global south dollars are everywhere and people don't have any choice about how that dollar is utilized in the local economy so i think when we start to focus on the political aspects of how this can give us true economic sovereignty 
and also the philosophical aspects of how this can create a new form of law that's much more fair, I think we'll start to see a lot more people coming on board, not because they, they have any kind of technical chops or even, you know, are skilled at it, but because they are really hungry for a change. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm just concerned that, you know, most people, especially sort of the developed or Western, you know, like in Europe over here, or um, people just don't have the time, the nerves, the energy, you know, they're so distracted. They have so much burden. It's life is so onerous, you know, people got to work and pay off their whatever the debts. It just, yeah. And then the pain points is not there. So uh, unfortunately, I think um, the these external pressure points uh, will have to come and will come uh, starting in 2020, 2020, 2021 or something like that, beginning in, you know, central uh, Europe, in Germany, uh, experts are, you know, saying, um, you know, people, <laughs> banks are going to go insolvent, you know, negative rating interest policies, insolvency. So all these things are going to accelerate this process. And, and I think people are waking up. It just, t- it just takes time. It's just, uh, asking myself how could we you know what what is really needed like is it a documentary well, the, uh, you know <laughs> the the other one i had a good friend point out to me too that i think is really essential is uh we're only a decade into this man mm-hmm. like look at how huge it is already right. you know like i think about when my son's an adult you know like the the idea of having a bank account with fiat money and it will probably be laughable to him and i think about that for most people, you know, and like, what does it look like in 30 years when Bitcoin has militantly maintained its issuance? And the United States has, you know, inflated the dollar 10 times what it is today. And that European bank accounts have an 8% fee for fiat, you know, uh, denominated accounts. Like, it seems pretty obvious to me that we're, it's escalated enough to the point where like we're we're actually at the nation state level in terms of how it's starting to play with things Mm -hmm. and also like stuff like this pandemic coming up like that like it's fucked up to say but like the truth is is that like as with the meme like this is good for bitcoin because the truth is is that every single nation state you know if they have a pandemic at their epicenter that's going to cause for horrific amounts right. of economic damage that, yeah. you know, frankly, Bitcoin is resistant to. Yeah. Uh, totally on uh, with you. I agree with you on that. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Let's, let's continue this discussion maybe next time, uh, Eric. Uh, but do you have okay. any, any other like um, final thoughts people should, you know, look into? Besides your yeah, website? you know, I'd, I'd say if, if you have a curiosity about uh, some questions for deeper philosophical issues, I'd highly recommend come to my website and check it out. Uh, it can be intimidating to go through because there's, uh, there's a lot of deep philosophical context in Latin and other things, but start exploring it. You know, I think it's really, really important that people ask themselves, why is it that, that the Bitcoin blockchain functions in the way it does? Mm-hmm. Why can't it violate its oath? How is it that it's able to create this semantic form that's inviolable? Investigate it. And I think as you go down the rabbit hole more, you'll become more convinced, you know? And and actually, I think one of the the final ones too is I I think a much larger target for uh, Bitcoin enthusiasts is we need to start going after other crypto folk. And I think we need to be more aggressive with that too. You know, like I I know a lot of people that are really enthusiastic about Ethereum. and the truth is, is like, they don't actually understand monetary economics and that's fine, but yeah, that, I will yeah, too way too much into a tech. I think it's just too tech obsessed. Uh, I think, yeah, you know. you know, and I, and I think that really getting them to dig into the philosophical aspects can kind of have a turning happen because, you know, I think Ethereum is a really interesting project and it has potential to do some really cool stuff on the internet but I don't think it's money because of the fact that the supply can be changed at the will of the Ethereum foundation. Plain right. and simple. Exactly. You know, and, yeah. and I, and I hope that more guys will understand that because I think, I think if we can really establish like Bitcoin is the political monetary cause, all this other stuff can be cool tertiary stuff, but like, don't call it money. Don't make its mission about replacing the financial system because Bitcoin's got that covered. Right. And it's got really, um, 
you know, the, the, the best monetary properties and the Lindy effect has already taken care of it. I mean, even if, even if any other, whatever cryptocurrency could have achieved that it's, it's too late already because after 11 years of Bitcoin, uh, uh, or what, you know, it's already, uh, right. It's already rooted and, uh, it has, you know, exactly all these uh, properties and features one could dream of, of, you know, the hardest, scarcest and decentralized and censorship resistant, permissionless and every other money monitor property you can think of. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's funny because for, for a long time, uh, and one of the reasons why the website's crypto sovereignty, not Bitcoin sovereignty is, uh, I wanted to leave the door open for the potential of, uh, like another currency or something mm -hmm. in conjunction with really focusing on the dialogue about cryptography being the power. But I'm really having this turning now where uh, I feel like, look, like they, whatever else comes up, uh, it, I don't want to say it's pointless, but like the first mover of, of Bitcoin is established, as you said, the Lindy effect has already, already gone into play. Uh, I think that efforts being focused elsewhere is, is, is really a waste, you know, and, and not to say that there isn't cool, valuable cryptography that comes out of that, but more of if we really want to focus on creating a powerful global decentralized financial system bitcoin is the best bet for it and and we can use all the help we can get with getting the word out there and making it happen um you know and and so on i guess on on the leaving notice i'll say that look this thing's only been active for 10 years and we're already this far into it and so i'm convinced that we're going to see a much greater escalation over the next decade uh, and truth is, is hopefully I'll be back here having a conversation with you in, in 2030 and we'll be talking about how Bitcoin is really allowing for nation states to fundamentally transform their economies that allow for their citizens to be empowered and that we get this renewed exactly. idea of, I don't even want to call it democracy because it's like some new radical technologically advanced social system of both discussion and consensus and it's going to be really wild and weird but i have a lot of hope you know and i think that that means a lot particularly in the world of today where stuff is really wild and right. there's not a lot of hope there and you said 2030 because i read a couple of posts for the conclusion here um uh, is that um um 99% of all Bitcoin is going to be mined by 2030. So the remaining whatever 1% or, or whatever, uh, right, is go mm -hmm. going to take time till what, 20, 2040, 2045 or something like that. So yeah, well, I think it's going to be like 2035 now because like the block okay. time actually sped up a tiny bit. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So that may, that shows, you know, demonstrates its real hardness of this, you know, uh, of, of Bitcoin. Anyway. Absolutely. And it's great because, like, we don't have to do anything with it other than advocate for it, you know? And, exactly. like, uh, that's why I'm really excited to see companies like River popping up because once we kind of get this stick in the flag in the ground that, like, Bitcoin's the thing that's going to make it happen, uh, there's, like, a whole new race that renews. Like, I'm really excited to see there's going to become, like, in my opinion, there will probably be something that will pop up either in... in the far east or in europe that'll be similar to river and it'll create for this really kind of healthy competition of like who can become the best bitcoin bank <laughs> let's leave it at that eric thanks so much for your time and hope to talk to you soon again it was really a pleasure enjoyed it a lot and yeah hope thank to thank you so much for having me on the show and uh, yeah i look forward to talking the next time <laughs> all right thanks so much bye-bye take care man ciao take care so hey there, so I hope you loved my talk, my interview with Eric Kaysen as much as I did. Um, it was a really amazing talk. I learned a lot again and hopefully you too. Uh, really want to, you know, deliver highest quality, uh, you know, content, podcasts, video interviews uh, in the future. So I want to do this more live, face-to-face, -face, personal interviews. Uh, for this, I would really need urgently uh, sponsors, ethical Bit, preferably Bitcoin sponsors, uh, ethical sponsors. So if you have any questions, um, you can help me in any shape or form you want, you know, like, subscribe, share, retweet, repost, whatever you do, just help me in any way or leave a positive review on any podcast platform on YouTube. The links and is in the show notes. 
And yeah, thanks so much for supporting, for listening. And let me know if you have any questions. You can write me to hello at thetotalconnector.com or kd at kvandavani.com. Yeah, have a good day and thank you so much for support. Bye. Thank mm-hmm. you.